President Calderon? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, basically, uh, I will skip some of my slides. I want to express my gratitude to Brown University for these invitations. But, you know, Basic, the basic thing, so you analyze the events just in this academic year in Brown, see the words of the most devastating typhoon in the Philippines, uh, the extreme winter in the U.S., in New York, for instance, is the worst in 100 years, uh, the floods in the U.K., the wettest December in Scotland on records, or this, the most severe the drought in California ever, the driest year on record. In, which it has a tremendous impact, for instance, in the price of foods right now and the, the, the life of the people there. So the point is, clearly, we need to go through all the basics again. We need to say to the people what exactly is happening. Global warming is the root of this. That is, the, you can see in red, uh, the increase in temperature in the last century over the average uh, in, in blues. There are some dots in blue in which is the, the other way around, but basically, the, the earth is, uh, is getting, getting hotter. You can see the, the last three decades have been the hottest decade on record since 1850, uh, and, uh, and that's part of the report of the IPCC this month. So the point is, what is clear is, this is you can see the measures of the sea level, which is actually increasing due to climate change, global warming, I'm sorry, first. So, you know very well the basics. And we need to remember the people that all those phenomena are associated with carbon emissions. Just to talk about uh, the performance of carbon emissions, since I was born, uh, CO2 emissions of fourfold in my lifetime, four times. And if you go back to 50s, it's six times. So it's, it's getting worse. And it's a clear correlation between carbon emissions and global temperature. And depending on the forecast of emission, we will have either uh, two degrees or four Celsius degrees at the end of this century. So those are the basic. And the basic idea is it's the current policy scenario, and we need to move towards new policies and even the ideal policies regarding to curve the emissions in order to get only a maximum of two degrees that we agreed in Cancun. So everybody knows about that, but uh, what can we do? And that is the reason about our effort we are doing in the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate. The people, honestly, between us, global leaders and businessmen and presidents and prime ministers and congressmen, they don't care about climate change, honestly. A lot of people, we say uh, Mexico, very bad expression. I will not to repeat because my mother told me never <laughs> say that kind of words. But uh, the point is they don't care. Why, if the scientific evidence is so clear, we are not taking the right measures? And the point is we need to change the strategy to persuade the people and the leaders in the business community and the political leaders to take the right decisions. What could be that strategy? And I will quote that very famous says in the Pleasant and Clinton campaign. When his team was deciding the political strategy, somebody said, it's the economy, stupid. No, <laughs> no my friends, uh, it's the economy, stupid. And we need to change the arguments. And what we need to do is to provide key elements that are able to demonstrate that it is possible to get economic growth and fighting climate change. The main obstacle that we are facing is for most of the leaders, especially after this terrible crisis we had, to take responsibility, as President Lagos was saying, implies a lot of economical cost. So I'm not going to reduce the economic growth. Uh, do this idea that this President Lagos is saying, because I'm president, when I want to win the next elections, I, I don't want to, pro to propose to, the peop to my people to reduce economic growth and so on. Yes, there is a dilemma, but we need to what? That is a false dilemma. And the goal we have in the Global Commission of the Economy and Climate is to produce, but this September, a report in which we want to demonstrate that that is a false dilemma, therefore, 
there is a way in which we can get economic growth, poverty alleviation, and of course, responsible behavior towards the environment. So it is possible to tackle climate change, and it is possible to tackle poverty on, and create jobs. So how can we do that? So what, what, what we are exploring is a group in which President Lagos, one of the most admired for me presidents and leaders in the world currently, and other former leaders like Jens Stoltenberg, former prime minister of Norway, or people coming from business sector like Paul Polman, CEO of Unilever, or Mr. Holiday, CEO of Bank of America, uh, people, CEO of Bloomberg, and others. Uh, and of course, the co-chair of the commission is Nick Stern, people uh, leading the economic team. The idea is to go through the economic arguments to provide the community with the right economic arguments. Also, our point is like this. Scientists have rested their case already. Is that clear? We cannot go beyond. Beyond the point that the APCC demonstrated, it's, it's a question of faith. It's not a question of science. And the question of faith is, do you believe in climate change or not? So we cannot go there. Uh, for the Republicans and the Democrats, it's like a question of faith. Now, come on, it's not a question of faith, but we cannot go beyond. So are you concerned about the economy? About your concern about the jobs? Let's do with jobs. And that is the goal of the commission. And what are basically the ideas, very quickly, uh, due to time? We need to go through several, several, uh, can, I, can I borrow my, my paper? I forgot that. I'm sorry. I do this all the time. But, uh, we say the accordion in Spanish, but anyway. <laughs> we can do trying to change the part of the economy in several ways. One, we need to go first with the, I would say, the, the low harm fronts. We need to invest in no regret measures. What is that? It's amazing. The key issue is at least half of the effort we need to make, it is possible to do even without paying any economical costs. How is that? So there is a very famous, I know it's controversial, but quite, quite famous, um, sorry. How can I do that? Well, this is a very famous uh, graph. So you can see in this axis. The, uh, it's a correlation with carbon emissions. So, I'm sorry, it's a, it's, it's a question of cost. What is the cost to take this measure, for instance? Let me take uh, nuclear. This is estimated that nuclear in some time implies like a positive economic cost. But it, and of course, it's correlated with in the horizontal is the number of the capability of those measures to reduce carbon emissions. But let's say, let me talk only about cost, about economic cost. What is curious is all these activities in the left side, they have negative net present value cost. And what that means, my dear friends, net negative net present value cost, negative cost, imply real business, imply money, profits, jobs, and economic growth. And if, if we do all those activities through the right public policies to, as a clear incentive to the society and business, to do this, we can make a real change on that. Let me give you one example. Appliances, which is, why is so positive in economic terms? Because you, all of us, when we were married, so the people who are married, so, <laughs> so the refrigerators were very intensive in energy consumption, like three or four times that current refrigerator. If you change your refrigerator for a new one, you will have less consumption, less electricity bill, and less carbon emissions. So it's a win-win situation. What we did in Mexico, for instance, at that plan, we organized a plan in order to provide a small subsidy for poorest families with affordable credit in order to substitute the refrigerators. Actually, the, the program was, the name of the program was really boring. When the minister came, tell me, President, the name would be something like Saving Energy Program in Appliances, Domestic Appliances, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's really boring. Let me think. So we, the Mexicans, say to the, the wives, call us the husband, mi viejo, or my old man, my old, no, my old, so my old one. So the program, the name of the program was Cambia tu viejo por uno nuevo. <laughs> so 
exchange your old one for a new one. It was fantastic, yes. Let me say, some ladies were a little bit disappointed when they arrived to the store to see what exactly the program was about. But at the end, we sold one million and a half refrigerators, saving a lot of energy for the families and a lot of money for the families and for the government. So that's, if you analyze a lot of this question, other is not appearing here because the British who prepared these people from McKenzie don't know very well the example of Chile. Chile has a fantastic example of success in forestry, as the president was saying. It's a real business. You can plant trees, and you can get a lot of money, and at the same time, you can sequestrate. You can capture carbon emissions. And it, it doesn't appear here. I don't know why. So there are some uh, issues related with degraded forest reforestation, but it's not exactly the same. I'm talking about real business. But I can pass hours and hours, but let me, let me skip this. this. Other example, the next Nest is a company that uh, is providing this quite fancy thermostat that are saving billions of kilowatts hour. And at the same time, the company is getting a lot of value. So Google bought Nest for 3.2 billion recently. So companies providing solutions with carbon emission reductions are getting real business and real profits. That's the kind of things that we need to think about in order to provide alternatives to the debate. Other, second question, design in better cities. As the President Lagos was saying, by the year 2050, we will be, I hope we will be there, yeah. like 9 billion people. Where all those billion people will live? They will live in cities. Somebody is estimating that only in the next 25 years, more than 1.5 billion people will live in cities. That implies to build more than 1,000 cities of 1 million people, completely new. So all those people will live in some cities. And what could be the right way to do those cities? It's going to be like this American style in which every, everyone wants to have their own front garden and backyard and very big houses or whatever. And the highways, you, know, you need to drive a lot of, it's the case of Mexico City as well, but it's very expansive, or lack of density cities. Is that the model for the future? Of course not. If we are going to build 1,000 cities of 1 million people at least, we need to do in a different way. Let's see <clears throat> the perspective of this. One is this explosion, which is good news, of global middle class, uh, that it was uh, in the 90s only 1 billion people. Three years ago, four years ago, 2 billion people is increasing. As President Lagos was <coughs> saying, in Latin America, Asia, and probably in Africa, there will be a massive explosion of middle class, which is good news. But by the year 2030, there will be 5 billion people, which implies that 60% of the total population of the world will live in cities by 2030. So the point for the commission is like this. If we are going to build those cities, it's better for us to build them in the right way, to build them in affordable conditions for the economy and for the climate as well. That implies that better designing, but implies uh, isolated houses implies new rules regarding massive transportations and so on. Is that a future for us? It's going to be an incredible increase in vehicles. By the year uh, 2010, 1 billion vehicles. By the year 2050, there will be 3 billion, 5 billion vehicles. How many, how many vehicles we have? It's not possible to grow in that way. So we need a different way to do things. So basically, another, the people Currently, more than 3 million people are dying from air pollution in the world, even without considering the people dying inside the, their houses due to very poor conditions. Well, this is about the models of uh, the cities. You can see in this axis the density, and in this vertical axis the annual gasoline use per capita. So you can see some very dense cities like Hong Kong, which is, I'm not suggesting to live in that way, the packet way to live. But maybe there is the European style, which is fancy, some more equally ready way in which the density it has a great combination with the intense, uh, intensity of the use of gasoline. But what about the American cities? What about Boston, for instance? You can see Boston over there, oh, or Washington, D.C., or Houston, which implies an incredible consumption of gasoline. 
So taking now the economic and public policy decision regarding your bonds, we will have a part of the solution of carbon emission reductions that we need with economic development. And even we can estimate, if we follow the Swedish model, with more density, or we follow the US model, there will be incredible differences that we need to, we need to avoid with the decision at global level. Moving, other, promoting structural changes in energy. Fortunately, renewable energy is growing in an amazing, in an amazing way, more, almost 300% only in this century. Basically, it's wind energy and basically solar energy are registering the highest uh, rates of percentage of growth, which is good. But still today, this kind of renewable energy only implies less than 4% of the total source of energy. We need to increase that. Now, what are the goods and the bad news of <coughs> about this? Bad news. The proposed new, uh, let, me, let me back to say that uh, if you analyze the big enemy, I would say, it could be coal, yeah. which implies 41 percent. Oh my god, what is happening with it? <laughs> I need to be a little, little bit less enthusiastic, but coal is, <laughs> is the big enemy. It's most of the emissions are coming from coal. So the bad news are coming from this side. If you analyze the proposed new coal power capacity, that is the case of India, and that is the case of China. So one of the key issues we need to reach is how to avoid such expansion of coal projects providing the Chinese and Indian governments with alternatives. Mm -hmm. and, and the key issue, there are several scenarios in which we are looking in which moment coal emissions in China will reach a peak and then start to descend. That's one issue. Good news on the other side is renewable. <coughs> if you see the cost of uh, wind power, the cost is going down dramatically due to technology. And there will be a point that coal, that wind energy will be cheaper than coal. And in some, some cases, it's cheaper already, depending on the price of natural gas here in the United States. And that's the same case of solar. So solar has coming down from $400 uh, could be dollars megawatt hour uh, on, a few years ago to only like less than $100 megawatt, which implies huge changes in technology that, again, solar will be cheaper or could be cheaper than coal and gas. That's a good news. The bad news is, the, the good news, again, is the global or the energy revolution here in the state re relating to shale gas and fracking is providing the cheapest natural gas in the world in Japan, the natural gas could, could be like $16 per million of BTUs. In the United States, it's like 3 to $4 million of BTUs. The same case in Mexico. Good news, what? Because natural gas will defeat coal in the United States. The bad news is natural gas could defeat renewables as well. So we need to work in order to improve the technology to, to make them even more cheaper. Other smart policies from <coughs> technology. So we need to invest. If, if I were in government again, I cannot be, but anyway, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but we need to invest, we need to invest Just like. In case. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't say that because it's a very violent event. Uh, one day I will talk about the Mexican <laughs> history, but the, the, the government needs to push for, probably for three or five key disruptive technology. For instance, batteries. That is crucial. And if we need to put or all our resources, maybe we need to put in those kind of research. Uh, there are some quite interesting issues. <clears throat> what happened with technical change? That's a very relevant issue for the debate. For some people, with the case of Porter, policy promotes innovation that reduces the cost of regulation. That is true. With the right incentives, you can afford the cost of the change. But even more, it's not only a question just to pay the cost of the dance. You can get, again, economic growth more than the cost of the innovation, because innovation provides competitiveness and profitability. And that's a key issue that a lot of people are ignoring. If you push with the right public policies innovation, you will have in, uh, positive effects in the economy re regarding with competitiveness. The clearest example of that 
is energy efficiency. You have a factory and you are able to reduce the intensity of uh, carbon of your production, you will get less cost, which implies more profits. Actually, when all those policies in Europe and other parts started uh, putting incentives regarding renewables, for instance, or some barriers like tax carbon or, or market cap for carbon, the innovation started to provide better and better uh, results regarding renewable energy. Or this amazing case. Look at this. It's a beautiful card. I prefer the blue one, but anyway. It's a Tesla. Tesla is a vehicle, maybe you know it, but it's able to travel 400 kilometers with one single charge of electricity. And Tesla, look, the, but again, don't talk about carbon emissions. Talk about profits. Talk about market cap. The price of the company right now in the market. What is the price of General Motors? The market cap of General Motors is almost 56, 56 billion, let's say $60 billion selling almost 10 million vehicles a year. Tesla has a price of 30 billion, more than the half, selling only 25,000 uh, 25, cars. So again, there are activities good for the environment that are an incredible businesses. So we need to promote the new economy exactly in this way. Forestry, as President was saying, is crucial. And I, I'm dealing with our colleague, uh, fellow members of the commission, the British, which are very enthusiastic about climate change, but they probably we are not providing the real importance to forestry. Again, Chile is an incredible success, I, as, final, as Finland, as Norway, and we need to make forestry profitable. There are several ways to do that. One is forestry itself, which is the special specialization of Chile. Other is, for instance, that the problem first. We are losing 50 soccer fields each minute in the world, and that is probably 20% of the total carbon emissions in the world. So this morning we have lost how many, probably well, 500 <laughs> soccer fields this morning in this event. Huh? Now, there are very successful examples. Look at this hill in Korea, for instance, in the 60s and 2000s. It is possible to recover forestry. And the good news is, as long as you are recovering forestry, you are capturing carbon <laughs> and storing carbon. And you see, real mechanism to tackle climate change in developing countries in Africa or Latin America. Look at the case of Costa Rica, for instance. You can see the evolution of the cover of the forestry in Costa Rica in the 40s. Like all, all our countries, a uh, devastating process, a very unresponsible one. But where in Mexico, even in the 80s, there was a commission with an incredible budget coming from the federal government, and the aim of the commission was deforestating. That was the name <laughs> of the commission. The, the, the aim was to provide all the land for agricultural purposes, erasing the rainforest and the woods in Mexico. That's incredible. But anyway, Costa Rica lived exactly the same process. However, Costa Rica started to apply a payment on environmental services just to protect him the forest. And what happened in the 90s to up to date? So Costa Rica started to recover the coverage, and now 52% of the surface of the territory is covered by forest again. And that is implying, which is quite interesting thing, which is 25,000 jobs a year. Green jobs because Costa Rica is among the leaders in ecotourism. That's one economic activity different from forestry itself. Oh, they're promoting double green revolution. We need to feed those five, nine billion people by 2050. So we need to produce more food in the same or less surface, which implies a double green revolution. The green revolution, as you know, was named the revolution that provided more productivity to the, to the farms in the 60s and 70s. It started in Mexico, by the way. And double green because this time needs to be friendly with the environment. Some examples. Well, I will skip this because very complicated slide. Pal oil. If you see all the products in a grocery store, from soap to oil or whatever, 50% of all those products are related with palm oil, which is incredible. Now, one way to do that is this model designed for one of the members of the commission, which is Paul Polman, who is Paul Polman. 
he say, well, in the past, especially for instance, Indonesia or the same case of Brazil, yeah. people are deforestating in order to plant palm oil, which is the worst case scenario probably. But now we have degraded land and we can plant palm oil instead and we can recover that forest. Not forest exactly in the original way, but we can get in uh, green areas capturing uh, carbon emissions. What are these companies, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, and Nestle are doing? They are organizing like a supply chain in which they have a commitment in which those companies only will buy palm oil coming from certified plantations, which is fantastic. So in this way, uh, the area, the plantation area certified is growing, but nevertheless, they are buying only 16% up to date. But if we reach 80% of all the total purchases of palm oil coming only from certificated plantation, we will make a huge difference in the world. Another, well, finally, I, I want to end with this. We need to, to make bold signals from in the economic field. And one of the most important is related with fossil fuels. We need to remove fossil fuels in the world. More than 500 million uh, a year, billions, I'm sorry, are dedicated to fossil fuel, which is stupid. And only <laughs> less than 100% related with renewable subsidies. We need to change that equation. We need to remove fossil fuels. And even in the future, we need to think about how to put the right economic incentives to promote this green growth the part with low carbon part. Another could be for carbon tax or carbon mechanism. I know this is very controversial, but anyway, my point, and I, f I will finish with this, is it is possible. What well, is related with cost? There is a huge debate. Don't get involved in this, but you, for every dollar we can spend today, if we don't do that, we will need to spend almost $5 in the future paying the cost. But let's finish with my conversation here. The point is like this. Climate change is happening. It's threatening the human being. Climate change is correlated with global warming, and global warming is correlated with carbon emissions. Uh, and indeed, carbon emissions are correlated with human behavior. We can reduce carbon emissions, but in order to do that, we need not only to provide the scientists' evidence to the global community, we need to provide economic arguments demonstrating that it is possible to get economic growth job creations, and poverty alleviation, meanwhile tackling cli climate change. So that is what the new climate economy is about. So thank you for your invitation. <laughs> <laughs>